Many of them are good songs. <laughs> Talking about serving him. <laughs> when I was a little boy, I used to go to Ballard's Chapel a lot. It's over in Blunt County. And I remember when I was, oh, I don't know, about like this, six, six, seven years old, preachers would get up and start preaching, and I'd look at them and I'd think, what a bunch of nuts. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to be there. I had my mind on everything in the world. Now here I am preaching. You never know how things are going to turn out, do you? Amen. Turn the book of Acts with me, please. The book of Acts chapter number 16. Acts chapter 16. And verse number 16. Acts 16, 16. It came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, Notice the Spirit, not the girl, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he, masculine, came out the same hour. Father, I pray that you bless your holy word now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you look at back, back at verse number 9 of Acts chapter number 16, a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia, Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, what you're talking about here is leaving Asia Minor and going into Europe. This is the first excursion into Europe to carry the word of God to Philippi, which is in the area of Macedonia. And the Apostle Paul, of course, with Silas, being obedient to God, are carrying God's word as missionaries and evangelists into this area and preaching the word of God. But Satan is very, very, very subtle in the way he does things. And if you notice that this damsel that had the spirit of divination... She's literally a pythoness. Puthos is the Greek word for it. Go look it up when you get home and take a little time. And it has to do with the wisdom of the serpent. And she's connected with the, with the oracles of Delphi. She's connected with the spirit world telling this world what's going to happen. Now you have one of two sources. You can either appeal to the spirit world that is of this world and is of Satan, or you can appeal to God himself who is the source of all wisdom. The Apostle Paul had received the message that he was preaching, probably from Sinai. He said, I, I confess, conferred not with flesh and blood, but he went off into Arabia. And there he, while he was in Arabia, God began to reveal to him the great prophecies, mysteries of the New Testament church. And so here he had received the word of God from the Lord God himself, which is an entirely different spirit than he's dealing with here. And he had the spiritual discernment to know immediately that he wasn't dealing with some woman who's off her rocker, you know, some psychopath or whatever you want to call them. He's dealing with a demon-possessed woman. And dealing with a demon-possessed woman, he spoke directly to the demon, Daimonion. He spoke to the demon. And in this case, it's a male demon. He spoke to it and commanded it in the, in the name of the Lord Jesus to come out of her. He didn't speak to the woman. He spoke to the demon. He confronted it face on. And of course, if you do that, to, do that today, most of the religious circles today say, what a nutball. I mean, he, he believes in demons. Ha, 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 ha. The Lord Jesus did, folks. You know, I marvel at the arrogance of men. But the Apostle Paul confronted this thing and it came out. And the reason it came out is a number of reasons, but reason number one, the apostle knew the one he was talking about. He knew the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of God confronted this thing, and it then had to be, it had to deal with the authority of the resurrected Christ. This demon did, and he couldn't handle that, and out it came. Where it went, we don't know, but it left this woman. Now she was a slave girl. She was being used to make money. They were making a lot of money off of her. And the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Somebody, a wise man said one time, if it doesn't make any sense, somebody's making money. <laughs> and there's an awful lot of stuff going on in the country right now that doesn't make any sense. But somebody is making money. 
I've found in life that just about anything that you deal with, any aspect of it, any perspective you have of life, somebody's got a hand in the deal. Somebody's making money. There are very few things in this world that are given from, the, from, from what we call all truism. Somebody who's simply from the love and generosity of their heart, they want to help you and they want nothing in return. It's wonderful to find somebody like that, isn't it? Well, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He went to the cross at Calvary. He gave you himself and gave you his blood, died for you, and asked nothing in return but for you to simply accept what he did for you. Here's the free gift of God. Accept this free gift. And that's all you have to do. I was listening to a man this morning before I came to church, early this morning, probably 5, 30, 6 o'clock. He's a Sabbatarian. Now, whether you're a Sabbatarian or not a Sabbatarian, in other words, they keep the Sabbath day, which is Saturday. And the Apostle Paul said in the book of Colossians, don't let any man judge you according to meat or drink or the Sabbath days. In the book of Romans, he says, if one man esteemeth one day above another, let him be persuaded in his own mind. You can go to heaven and be a Sabbatarian. You need to get that right. That's not going to keep you out of heaven. You can take one day, set it aside, and recognize the Sabbath day. That's not going to keep you out of heaven. Except the fact that that you're keeping that and you look at that as your righteousness, then you've got an issue with God. For the only righteousness that matters is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way that righteousness can be yours is by simple faith believing and accept Him to be your righteousness. But anyway, what I found very intriguing this morning was the fact that he spent about ten minutes talking about how you keep the Sabbath day. How much can you cook on the Sabbath day? How long can you cook? What can you do? Where can you go? What if you're going somewhere and you cause somebody to have to work, you know, to support what you're trying to do on the Sabbath? In other words, it got into the nitty gritty, the technical aspect of the Sabbath day. And I said to myself, son, my son, when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary, he paid for it all. Not part of it. Every last bit of it. Amen. And if you'll read the book of Hebrews and read it carefully and pray over it while you're reading it, you'll find out that the Lord Jesus Christ is our rest. And that's what the Sabbath is. Shabbat in Hebrew means rest. Shabbat shalom. The peace of God goes with you and rest. And this is what they're talking about. Rest is no longer a day, folks. Rest is no longer a person, a place. Rest is a person. Like I said so many times, all that Old Testament prophecy, all the great blessings of the Old Testament, everything God required in the Old Testament have now been brought down to a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here she is preaching, and she says, These be the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. The Apostle Paul said, No way am I going to accept that endorsement on the preaching of the Word, because that will create confusion in the people because they know she is a demon possessed. Of course, they don't know demon, but they know she is a spirit possessed woman. And if I allow her to come on board and preach and say, and even though what she's saying is true, if I allow her to do that, that is me giving my, my approval for the spirit that is in her. So we must be careful about the spirit that comes into the church. Even though that spirit is saying the truth, you've got to try the spirit. Because they'll give you the truth to get through the door, and then they'll slip you the lie. They'll give you the lie. They'll never be able to stand completely for the truth. They can give you a half-truth. And when Satan said to our parents back there in the garden, he said, God doth know the day you eat thereof you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That was the truth. But it was only the half-truth. He said, God doth know, implying, impinging, impinging. The, the character and authority and truthfulness of God as if he was holding something back from them and he wasn't holding anything back from them except what they needed to know. So the Bible tells us here in the book of Acts chapter number 16 that they did this. And what happened? Well, what happened is simply this. She lost her gain saying the demon came out. She was just, a, just like an, one of the other ladies in the community. And the people who made money off of her got angry and they went to the magistrates and had them thrown in jail. And in verse number 25 of the book of Acts chapter 16, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. That's real prayer. 
That's real praise and that's real singing. <laughs> Just the two of them. But notice the Holy Ghost wants you to know and the prisoners heard them. That's what's important about it. They witnessed to the saving grace of God and His ability to keep them and not forsake them in the midst of their trials and tribulations. We've had it easy, folks. The church has had it easy. We don't know what persecution is, but I'm afraid persecution may be right around the bend. We've had it easy, and so many of the churches have gone asleep, and they're dead. They're asleep and they're dead because they haven't had to deal with what the Coptic church in North Africa deals with when they marched all those young men out there next to the Mediterranean and cut their heads off. And then 10,000, I saw this on YouTube about a year ago, 10,000 cops, Coptics were out there singing glory to God and praising His holy name. And they had just lost all these young men to ISIS. They know what persecution is like. They know what it's like in Syria. Do you realize that in Syria right now, dear friends, that Christians have been dying by the thousands? Do you realize that in Antioch of Syria is one of the most ancient seats of Christianity? Do you realize in the first century after Christ, two seats of Christianity arose? One was Antioch of Syria, the other was Alexandria in Egypt. North Africa to pr produced the apostasy that you see today, the Gnosticism, and uh, much of what's in the Catholic Church. But Antioch of Syria produced more clear orthodoxy, and it was there that it spread into the eastern branch of the church in Constantinople. So Antioch of Syria is the home of real Bible-believing Christianity. And the Bible says that they were first called Christians where? In Antioch. Syria, Mosul, Syria is an ancient city that has, that has an ancient witness and testimony to the saving grace of God. Christians are there, at least they used to be, until they were driven out and they were persecuted and they were crucified and their heads were cut off and they were burned and all these other things that were done to them. These are our brothers and sisters, folks, in Syria. And you don't hear much about that here in this country. You don't hear much about it in the news. But these are our brothers and our sisters that we'll meet one day at the Bema, the great judgment seat of Christ. We'll meet those who gave their blood. Martyrs. Martureo is the Greek word. It literally means a witness, but so many of them witnessed by the giving of their life that the word came to mean somebody who died for the faith. That's what a martyr, that's what it means now. But the original meaning of it was simply a witness. That's what a martyr, that's what the word martyreo means. I give witness or testimony. But so many of them died that the word came to mean one who gave their life. And so in the book of Revelation chapter number 6, the apostle John said, And I saw under the altar the souls of them that were beheaded for the word of God and for the witness of Christ. And that's where we're headed. We're headed there right now. Our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be tested. And when it's tested, it'll be tried. And when it's tried, it'll be purified. And a much purer form of the faith will rise up from this godless religious mess we call Christianity in this country. And believe me tonight, it is a mess. But it's going to be purified. And if you are truly born of the Spirit of the living God... You know where you're going. Hallelujah to God. Amen, amen. So Philippi is a place with a history. It's a European witness. When the Macedonian called, they went to Philippi. This is where the Holy Spirit led them. At midnight, they sang praises to God. Then the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the church at Philippi, if you'd like to turn there. And I'll give you four things there. Philippi wrote a letter, and I'll give you four things from this letter. In Philippians chapter number 1 and verse number 21, he told them how to live. He said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, he was absolutely obsessed with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's crazy, preacher. I don't know. I think it's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, to get up thinking about him, to go out you throughout your day thinking about him, and then go to bed at night thinking about him, and then wake up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning thinking about him. For my life is hid with Christ in God. Christ is my life. And when my life shall appear, I shall appear with him in glory. The Lord Jesus, you can't think too much on him. You can't praise him too much. You can't glorify his holy name too much. You can't thank the Lord Jesus Christ too much. Just like I say, there's one thing you cannot do too much of, and that's praying. You cannot pray too much. And how in the world can you pray and not have the Lord Jesus in the center of your prayer? 
Christians are Christ-like. That's what the word means. And if it's not about Christ, what in the world is it about? <laughs> sure not, I'm only part of the religion. If once it's not about Christ, folks, the Christian religion de uh, deteriorates into nothing more than just another religion. That's what sets us apart, is the fact that we love the Lord Jesus Christ, we exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, we live for the Lord Jesus Christ, we preach Christ and Him crucified. And Paul said, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Amen. So that's how to live. Then he tells you how to think. Look at chapter number 2 and verse number 5. He said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. Now watch this word form. That's the Greek word morphe. Have you ever heard the term metamorphosis? Big word. Let folks know you've had a dictionary. You've been to school. You know, you understand a few big words. Metamorphosis means a complete change of the morphe. In other words, the form. A complete change of the form. Like a caterpillar that becomes a butterfly. All right? The ugly, lowly caterpillar becomes a beautiful monarch butterfly. That's a metamorphosis. That's a complete change. When God saved your soul, you went through a metamorphosis. <laughs> You went through a complete change. Amen. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. And all things become new. So well, it didn't happen for me, then you didn't get saved. You got slipped to counterfeit. Amen. You got salved or something. You need to be saved. Now, the Bible said, who being in the form of God, morphe. In other words, a physical appearance. That's what it means. Who being in a physical appearance of God. Why is that important? It's important because God's invisible. If God had not created His creation, nothing would know He exists. Now digest that for a moment. <laughs> Think about it for a minute. If He had not created His creation, He'd still be that invisible eternal spirit residing in eternity with no creation about him, with no need of anything, from everlasting to everlasting, he is that God that is above the human mind to conceive. Inconceivable. But when he, when he moved out of the invisible and came into the visible and came to his creation, then he took a form by doing that. And the form that he took is the Lord Jesus Christ, who now is a visible, you can see, God manifest in flesh. Amen. Amen. And the apostle said in 1 Timothy 3, without controversy, grace, the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh, seen of angels. <laughs> in Hebrews 1 it says, let all the angels of God worship Him when He's born, when He bringeth the first begotten into the world. Boy, there's some stuff in there, but I've got to move on. Man, what a thing to think about as he makes his creatures, as he brings them into existence, and they marvel and begin to marvel and marvel more when they begin to realize the one that made us, we can't even see him. But we know he's real. And the only way they'll ever see him is through Christ. Nothing could ever see that invisible being save through the Lord Jesus Christ. No man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that can take you to the Father. And the taking you to the Father may not necessarily be taking you to a place. It's so easy in your human mind to put things down to where we can touch them. For Christ to take you to the Father simply means He's going to take you to that invisible one. And that may entail a whole lot more than simply taking you to a place. Taking you to that one that is from everlasting to everlasting. The Lord Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. See what he says? Thought it not robbery to be equal. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ is equal to God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. I'm a Trinitarian to the bone. Amen. I believe in one God. Deuteronomy 6, chapter, number four, chapter 6, verse 4. Hear your O Israel, the Shammai is what it's called. Hear your O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, one God. Yes, He is. One God. One everlasting, eternal being. But He is Father, He is Son, and He is Holy Ghost. 
Amen. And we can see the sun. And we can feel the Holy Spirit. And one day we will comprehend. And that's a big word because I can't fully define what it means as it relates to Him. But one day we will comprehend God the Father, that invisible being in His essence. Man, what a thing that'll be. Boy. Now what he said here in Philippians 2 is this. He said, Who being in the form of God, thought it not to be robbery, was, thought it not, to eat, not robbery to be equal with God. Now watch this. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. This is what's called the kenosis. If you ever hear that word again, that's what it means. If you ever hear somebody, somebody lecturing in the Bible and he uses that big word, kenosis. It means that self-emptying of Christ. When the Lord Jesus Christ came to this world, He emptied Himself. He emptied Himself. He poured Himself out and He emptied Himself completely. That's what it means. He took the form of a servant. What you find in Philippians 2 is this. You find a condescension and an exaltation. He comes down and the Father raises him back up. Now, that's a wonderful thing. Because that's the message he gets to us. You want to know how to think? Condes in other words, de go down. Don't condescend because you're not above us. <laughs> but descend, go down. That, you know, I thought a bumper sticker one time said, no, man's ever, no man ever stands any higher than when he's on his knees. And that's a good thing. It really is. That's an observation of a biblical truth. To go down, to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and He will exalt you in due time. The greatest virtue that I've learned as a Christian is humility. And it's the hardest to really get a hold of. Because we naturally operate in the realm of pride. It's all about human ability, human accomplishment, praise, recognition, awards, accolades that we hand on each other, we talk about each other, we blow each other up. But the truth of the matter is, you are far better off being humbled. This is why the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, because of the abundance of the revelations. And I preached that about to you this morning, you remember? The revelation, a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body or out, he said in 2 Corinthians 12, he said, because of the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. See what he's saying? He's saying, God would not let me get up here and dangle around, flying around on the mountaintops, you know, Christian celebrity and all of that, blah, blah, blah. No, he brought me down by a messenger of Satan and you can, you can conjecture and, and him haw and talk all you want to you're blue in the face about what it was what that, what that thorn in the flesh was it doesn't mean anything to me the thorn in the flesh was a thorn in the flesh that's all that matters it was something but that thorn in the flesh kept him down and when he was down then Paul said when I am weak then I am strong that's how to think then the Bible tells you how to watch. Chapter number 3 and verse number 2. Philippians 3, 2. Now he said in verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Now watch this. I mean, abruptly, just abruptly, bang, all of a sudden, beware of dogs. <laughs> beware of workers, evil workers. Beware, watch the way he says this. Of the concision. Now let's start with that one. Now this is a play on words. So what do you mean by that? There's a sign out here on Broadway that just put it up. I, I've seen it now for a couple of days. And it's a play on words. It says, do not dog nut your, uh, do, do not uh, remember, how does it say it? Do not dog nut remember your, your, your coffee. Yeah. Do not, uh, no, dog nut to remember your coffee, something like that. In other words, they're playing on dog nut to mean do not. You know, forget your coffee. Do not forget your coffee. Dog nut, forget your coffee. That's what they say. And it's, uh, uh, who is it down here that's got Dunkin' Donuts? Uh, yeah, Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dog nut, to, dog, nut forget, dog nut to forget your coffee. 
So that's a cute, clever play on the word donut. They've made it dognut, donut, and when not dognut, donut. I'll get it right here in a minute. So. <laughs> you only come here to help me, brother. <laughs> I'm sinking lower and lower. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> Lord. I'll get it right here in a minute. <laughs> Donut, forget your coffee. That's what it is. Okay. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Good. Glory to God. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> hey, my mouth went this way. My mind went that way. You've got to get them together. <laughs> But it's, it's a clever play on words. That's what it is. It's a play on words. Well, that's what's going on here. He calls it the concision. All right. What's he talking about? The circumcision. What's the difference? Concision simply means a cutting. Concision. All right. A cutting. So the Apostle Paul has reduced circumcision among the Jews as simply a cutting. In other words, liken to the Gentiles who cut themselves. You remember the Old Testament when these, when these prophets of Baal, the Bible said when Elijah confronted them that they went out and they cut themselves as the manner was and the blood gushed out. That was concision. They were cutting themselves. So the Apostle Paul is saying to these people, to the Judaizers, he's saying, your circumcision is no more than a, than a Gentile cutting themselves out here worshiping their God. That's strong, that's strong stuff. <laughs> because here's a man that was circumcised. Here's a Jew. A tribe of Benjamin. Circumcised, circumcised according to the law of Moses, all right? And, and he's saying it's nothing. He said it means nothing. And then he says, evildoers, watch out for the evildoers. God give you discernment to know the source. Like this Philippian, uh, this uh, girl in, in Philippi that had the spirit of Python. She was a Pythoness. Learn to discern the spirits because they can talk so sweetly. Oh, it can sound so good. But the truth of the matter is, there is an underlying motive, and Satan can quote Scripture, and he can quote it for his purposes and apply it as he wishes. It is written, he said to Christ. It is written, he said to Christ. It is written, he said to Christ. How did he know it was written? Because he read it. I dare say, folks, that the devil reads the Bible more than most Christians. <laughs> That's sad commentary, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. But notice the first one. Dogs. Now, if you've got a good old dog that's a good friend of you, good for you. And, you know, dogs in this generation today, you know, they say that this generation's got so bad, they kiss their dogs and kill their babies. <laughs> Amen. That's sad. There's nothing wrong with having a good dog. They say it's man's best friend. That's fine. All, all fine, well, and good. But in the Bible, a dog is a filthy creature. The Bible portrays a dog as a dirty animal, a dog that returns to its vomit again, the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Give not that which is holy to the dogs, cast not your pearls before swine. The Bible's pretty rough on classifications like this. Over in the book of Titus, he said the Christians are slow bellies, liars. In other words, they're idle gluttons. They're good for nothing. The Apostle Paul said, one of your own poets said that about you. And he said, this witness is true. So you have different types of people. No question about that. The Apostle Paul said, watch for these people. You're smart and you're wise if you keep your eyes open for a classification like that. The dog. Dogs and swine are both concerned about religious issues. God's people are never called dogs and swine. You're called children, children of God. And then finally, how to have peace. Look at chapter number four. So he tells us how to live, he tells us how to think, and he tells us how to watch. And then in chapter number, did I read chapter three, verse two for you? I believe I did. Be, yes, I did. Chapter then four, number four, how to have peace. Look at chapter number four in verse number eight. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And those things which you've both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. 
Amen. And peace is a wonderful thing, don't you think? Look at the book of Colossians, chapter number 3, verse number 16. In Colossians 3, 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Songs and psalms, a wonderful thing and a wonderful gift to the church of God. When you go back to the book of Ezekiel, you'll find out that the devil at one time was a great choir leader in heaven. So he is, he is intimately associated with music. He knows music very well, very well. You can look at music, how it's developed down through the centuries, and you'll see that there is a certain branch of music that is Christian, just like the Word of God. Then there is a branch of music that is satanic, not like the Word of God. The type of music you sing, the type of music you listen to, is going to determine the type of spirit that is dominating your life. Garbage in, garbage out. If you fill yourself full of the wrong stuff, it's going to affect your Christian walk. You've got to be careful as to what kind of music you listen to. And you know something? If your prayer, if your prayer life is where it ought to be, if you're prayed up and living for the Lord, walking with God and communion with God, you have that spirit of discernment that's going to tell you when the music you're listening to is good or bad. And I've heard people say today, well, it's just music. I mean, what's music? Music is neutral. No, it's not neutral. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's either good or it's bad. And you want, to, you want music that glorifies God, exalts Christ, and not self. Now, uh... This is, these are decisions you have to make on your part. You have to choose these things. But what you do, you fill your heart, you fill your life full of it. Music is a wonderful thing. It's a gift from God. They say that music is the universal language. It is. I mean, you may not be able to speak all the languages of the earth, but music, for some reason, speaks to everybody. And so the music that started in heaven, because that's where it started, folks, it started before the first man was ever made. They were singing and glorifying God. That music is with us to this day. And the music that is the music of Satan is also with us today. If you want to create confusion, you try to take worldly music and put Christian lyrics to it and think that you've Christianized it. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. You know what you've done? You've created confusion. And God's not the author of confusion. That just doesn't work. It never has and never will work. Just put yourself through a simple test. After a week of listening to a certain type of music, see what kind of shape you're in spiritually. Just a simple test. I mean, anybody can do that. That's not rocket science. After a week of watching the stuff you're watching on TV, see what kind of shape you're in spiritually. After a week of listening to whoever you're listening to on the radios, you drive to work or whatever you're listening to at work or whatever you're associated with, the crowd you run with, at the end of the week, see what that's done for your life spiritually. See what's done for you. You see, these are simple things, but they're profound in their effect on your life. You've got to be careful, folks. You've got to be careful. And here's especially this, because you live in a, in a media-saturated society. I mean... Boy, you got it coming from the internet, you got it coming from television, from the radio, you got it coming from well, the, your venues, the place that you go to. It's everywhere. Music is coming from every direction. And kids today used to, you know, when, when I was a kid, we had vinyl. We had vinyl, 33 and a third, 78, 45. We had these vinyl records that we played, all right? And you'd save up enough money to go out and buy one. They had record stores. You'd go through there and go through all of their records and buy the one you wanted. Then it went to eight tracks that you put in your car, all right? Then it went to cassette tapes, little cassette tapes like that, that you could play. Then it went to CDs. Now you know what it's gone to? It's simply electronic. You can download them from the web just like that. Put them on a thumb drive, and you've got, you can have as many songs on a thumb drive as you could fill up a whole room with vinyl. Uh, MP3 files, and you can adjust the... the, the uh, uh, the, the size of the file, I'm not sure what they call it, the bit rate or whatever it is, you can adjust that. And I mean, you can load it up with music. It's everywhere. So be very, very careful 
about the kind of music that you listen to. I am. I'm very selective, very selective in what I listen to because I know it can affect me and it will affect your spirit because there is no way that you can, uh, that you can divorce music from the spirit. They are inseparable. So it depends on what kind of music you're listening to as to what kind of a spirit that you're going to have. And then the apostle said this. He said, now, play the music. Listen to the music. Read the Psalms. Fill your life full of it. And he said that you can walk in the spirit by doing that. Amen. Amen. You can tell that this church, when it comes to music, is very, very smart. You know how I know that? Because you never asked me to sing. Y'all were good. <laughs> you know what? During the week, I don't listen to me sing either. <laughs> but I do appreciate good music. And just maybe, who knows, just maybe, when I get up there in glory and stand with the redeemed, and millions around me, that I open my big mouth and all of a sudden, music will come out of it like it never has before. Wouldn't that be something? In other words, I'd be able to sing. That'd be something. That would be. That'd be something. That really would. Amen. Father, I pray that you'd bless the word tonight. Bless my brothers and sisters that have come out to hear it, and those that are listening on the Internet, and those that will listen to it later. I pray you'd bless it, anoint it, and help somebody through the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless his righteous, holy name. Amen. We'd like to invite you to come down if you're going to be baptized tonight.